Welcome. I'm Tita Chico, faculty director and professor of English at the University of Maryland. We, uh, I'm sorry, faculty director of the Center for Comparative and Literary Studies and professor of English at the University of Maryland, pardon me. We convened this year long series on anti-racism to act on the various statements of solidarity for Black Lives Matter issued by the university, the college and the department. We also convened this series to honor and highlight the long-standing commitment among many English department faculty and students to anti-racist scholarship and teaching. To be clear, anti-racism is not an add-on in this series. It is an intellectual starting point for humanistic literary inquiry. Anti-racism is also a practice that leaves behind the platitudes it leaves behind the inadequacies of diversity and inclusion. As my colleague, Professor Zita C. Nunez writes, this is not the time, if ever there was such a time, for shifting over a bit to make room, for being the one to allow others to speak, for making promises. This is the time for remaking, for asking who we are. George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Black Lives Matter. And as an earlier guest of this series, Dr. David F. Green of Howard University writes, we must take time, and especially now, we must take time to say her name. Darnella Frazier, the young woman who recorded Mr. Floyd's last moments and played a crucial role in our bearing witness to his unjust death. Black Lives Matter. We're meeting virtually today, but we are grounded by our institutional home, the University of Maryland. With this series, we honor and we celebrate the memory of Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, a young black man who was about to graduate from Bowie State University in 2017 when he was murdered by a white supremacist at a campus bus stop. Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, Black Lives Matter. We're meeting virtually today, but we're also grounded by the sentimented lands upon which the university stands. The university is on what is now known as the state of Maryland, adjacent to the District of Columbia, the seat of the US federal government. But this land, these are the original homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway tribal nations. The university has buildings that name, but that also in naming forget this indigenous history. The home of the English department for many years, Susquehanna Hall. Susquehanna comes from the Lenape for Oyster River. Also on campus, a dorm, Queen Anne's Hall. Yes, that Queen Anne, the 18th century Queen Anne, the period in which large scale settler colonialism and genocide devastated these tribal nations. And Washington DC, it's home to a football team named until very recently with a racial slur. For the indigenous people still connected to this land on which we gather to evoke the phrasing of Professor Eugenia Zorowski, the long 18th century has never ended. And in, in this moment and in these spaces, these are moments and spaces where we bear witness to anti-Asian racism. As my colleague, Professor Janelle Wong writes, racial profiling does not stem from the same stereotypes for Asian Americans, black people, Muslims, and other groups, but it serves a common purpose to define who is essential and who belongs to the nation. The case of Asian Americans shows the varied ways in which the boundaries of belonging are enforced through old ideas that circulate over generations. These spaces, these time spaces, reveal to us in the words of Professor Lisa Lowe, the intimacy of modern Western liberalism and the global conditions upon which it stands. Intimacy, as Professor Lowe explains to us, is a means to observe the historical division of world processes. These divisions result in modernity, including modern liberal subjects 
and those that are, in her words, forgotten, cast as failed, or irrelevant because they do not produce value legible within modern classifications. Today, we are very honored to think through intimacy and disaffection, anti-racism, politics, and affect with our guests, Christine Zain Yao and Lisa Lowe. The Center's anti-racism series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries and the Graduate School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Today's event, I'm also very pleased to say, is co-sponsored by the Local Americanist Event Series and the 19th Century Transatlantic Event Series, as well as the Stringer Foundation. With this support, we are able to commit to making everything in the series accessible. And this means that there's live captioning available. I wanna thank Danielle Griffin and Liam Daly, the graduate assistants who have worked so hard this year at the center. And I wanna extend my very, very deep gratitude to Dr. Karen Nelson, co-director of the center and director of research initiatives at the center. Our program will be one hour. Our guests will be in conversation with each other for about 30 minutes, after which my colleague, Professor Sankita Ray will come back to moderate the Q&A. And we ask that you pose your questions in the Q&A function. Now, would you please join me in welcoming Professors Yao and Professor, uh, Professor Lowe for their conversation, Intimies, Intimacies and Disaffection, a conversation about anti-racism, politics, and affect. I, I guess I'll start things off. Um, uh, the talk today um, is in relation to my forthcoming book, uh, Disaffected, the Cultural Politics of Unfeeling 19th Century America, which will be out in Duke in 2021. And first, I want to acknowledge um, that there are unionizing efforts now of the, of the staff of Duke University Press. Um, and I add my voice to the many other uh, authors from Duke, and I'm sure many others who, um, for the very reasons that they, they value um, Duke University Press, because of the sort of critical thinking in, in politics that it engages. And so we do hope that, that that same sort of generosity and critical thinking will be um, adopted by, by the press itself um, in terms of, of recognition of all the labor that goes into making that critical work possible for, for so many of us. Um, and so today I'm speaking to you um, adorned with glitter in the former heart of empire um, at an institution which has been noted as the origin of eugenics. And yet I'm so thank you I'm so thankful to be part of this series, um, which opened so wonderfully with Eugenio Zorowski in conversation. So thank you so much to Tita Chico for inviting me. Thank you to Karen Nelson, Danielle Renee Griffin, Liam Daly. Thanks so much to Lisa Lowe for agreeing to be a part of this. Um, and also to Sankita Ray for uh, moderating the upcoming discussion. I also want to acknowledge so many of you who are here as part of the audience, that so many of you are friends or colleagues or friends and colleagues I haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting and that the work of this book for me was also about staying alive in order to write it, um, which may be something I'll discuss at some point. But first I wanted to just give um, a short reading from part of, part of the book and then go into discussion with uh, Lisa Lowe. So please bear with me. Um, first, I open with epigraphs. First from Denise Ferrer de Silva, affectability, the condition of being subjected to both natural and the scientific and lay sense conditions into others' power. Affectable eye, the scientific construction of non-European minds. The next comes from Martin Manilanson. By disaffection, I emphasize not only emotional distance, alienation, antipathy, and isolation, but also to center this word's other connotation of disloyalty to regimes of power. And finally, from Edward Glissant, I thus am able to conceive of the opacity of the other for me without reproach for my opacity to him. To feel in solidarity with him or to build with him or to like what he does is not necessary for me to grasp him. So, white feelings, white tears, white fragility, white women's tears, white men's tears. These phrases circulate within popular anti-racist social justice discourse galvanized by the Black Lives Matter movement. These phrases articulate frustration with the ongoing manifestation of what scholars have variously called the unfinished business of sentimentality, the legacies of the intimacies of four continents, and the biopolitics of feeling. They name the weaponization of white feelings in everyday life. Behind these uses is the implicit statement 
We know, indeed have always known, that white feelings produce and maintain structures of domination. To depend upon white feelings as a catalyst for social change reinscribes the world that enables their power. No more business with white sentimentality. Withhold from those colonial intimacies. Refuse to feel according to the hierarchies of the biopolitics of feeling. Be disaffected. So disaffected looks to American literature of the long 19th century to rethink the ongoing racial and sexual politics of unfeeling, not as oppression from above, but as a tactic from below. This book deliberately reads against the grain of the culture of sentiment to refuse the usual argument of, for arguing for the humanity of minoritized subjects by enlisting literature to affirm that they feel also. This affected asks what we can apprehend if we stay with the negativity of unfeeling and suspend its rehabilitation. And through this provocation, I seek to excavate unfeeling occluded by the stifling imperatives of the political stakes of sympathy. By foregrounding, the heuristic of unfeeling as disaffection in its effective causal and political meanings, this book makes key interventions into our understanding of affect and politics in American literature and culture, a paradigm that has disproportionately affected the world. First, I reconsider unfeeling as an index of the underacknowledged spectrum of dissonance and dissent, the critiques of demands of sympathetic recognition shaped by sentimentalism, questioning the liberal politics of inclusion. Second, I explore unfeeling in both the responsive and demonstrative senses as a quotidian tactic of survival and a counterintuitive, sometimes counteractive mode of care. Finally, I propose that these antisocial affects are vilified as unfeeling because they have insurgent potential that may not be legible or instrumentalized towards resistance. If we follow Raymond Williams' definition of structures of feeling as the effective workings of ideology and lived experience, we may consider disaffection to be the unfeeling rupture that enables new structures of feeling to arise. In other words, the reading of unfeeling as opposition legation functions as a defensive denial of the quickening, the flourishing, and renewal of alternate forms of sociality made possible by feeling otherwise. The philosophers Sylvia Winter and Denise Faradisola have argued that the category of man, referring to bourgeois Western whiteness, overrepresents itself as universal humanity, structured upon the suppression of racialized modalities of human as mere derivations. If we follow lines of inquiry opened up for us by their insights, what operations will we find concealed and enabled by the construct of universal feeling as a symptom and signifier of that coloniality? Affectability, according to De Silver in a study of Enlightenment universality, transmuted into the biopolitical apparatus of global modernity, which is going to my epigraph, of course, the condition of being subjected to natural and the scientific and lay sense conditions as the other power. And so affectability defines raciality. And although it was not written with, with affect studies in mind, as Tyrone S. Palmer points out, it points to the inextricable ability of affect from power. And so that's why I turn to disaffection as a break from that affectability. Um, and throughout the project, I trace um, an array of queer, racialized, and gendered modes of disaffected unfeeling that I see as emerging within dominating structures of feeling from a range of precarious positions within those axes of oppression. And these groupings that I have, like oriental scrutability, unsympathetic blackness, queer frigidity, are not meant to be taxonomic or exclusionary, but to articulate a few key coded categories in the cultural imagination deployed to flatten out and invalidate individual and collective subtleties. And I'm, I see myself as taking up um, an ongoing antisocial turn in affect theory and saying that unfeeling constitutes a break from dominant models of feeling. And in this regard, to do that sort of work, I take up the ethical charge to decolonize affect studies, turning to those queer and feminist to color theorists whose underappreciated contributions, the intellectual histories of feeling, that is, lack of recognition erasing their theorizations about the unrepresentable status of unfeeling the dominant episteme, which actually paradoxically positions them as thinkers who are uniquely pay attention to this disaffected sense of unfeeling. And so I think we could track unfeeling as a theory in the flesh, not necessarily as opposition to feeling, but as complement and lived experience. There's a necessary calculus of refusals. The apparent dull, dulling or lack of affect be a defensive tactic of everyday psychic survival in a world predicated upon racial and sexual violences. So for instance, to cope with hurt and control my fears, I grew a thick skin, states Ansel Dua, and Audre Lorde writes, in order to withstand the weather, we had to become stone. Her images of thick skin and stone indicate that the callousness of insensitivity may be development of an effective callous, protective hardening of the sensitive psyche against the wear and tear of everyday life and the repetitive tax of racialized and gendered emotional labor. And the, the different chapters that I have in my project conclude with um, my work on Suisse and Far, situating an Asian diasporic sensibility in relation to the previous chapters charting of the entanglements of emancipatory, decolonial, and feminist struggles rooted through the United States as construct. 
And a confession here, um, interwoven with the other structuring logics of my book, uh, it's no coincidence I finish off with VAR. Our lives have taken us through Canada, the US, and England. And through this book's organization and its writing, I've worked through my own positionality in relation to the histories, nations, structures, disciplines, and communities, and loved ones. Deferred until the end, according to the usual scholarly suspension, if not denial of any effective attachments to our work. But in my coda, I do write from experience of alienation and solidarity. This suggests that some ways that unfeeling can be taken up in everyday life. And so through this project, I hope to articulate something, if not useful to others, may resonate with their experiences. Ultimately, my work proposes that a feeling otherwise is the precondition for thinking and imagining otherwise. And I hope that this opening functions as an invitation to you to, about, to speculate about those possibilities. Thank you so much. Zain, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk with you about your wonderful book, um, which, as you said, will appear in the series that I co-edited at Duke um, in October. So I'm very happy to celebrate that and also really pleased um, to be included in this University of Maryland series that has been um, so significant to many people all year long, uh, really constituting a public forum for discussing uh, anti-racist practices in the university throughout this challenging year. So thank you, Tita, uh, Karen, Danielle, Liam, and Sangeeta, and many old friends in English and American Studies at University of Maryland. Let's just jump in. Um, this is such an amazing and capacious project, and the way you've elaborated disaffection um, as a uh, a practice is so suggestive. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit first about how sentiment became, affect and sentiment became so important in the 19th century to uh, this racialized order that you're describing in the book. How was the culture of sentiment so central to the 19th century? Mm -hmm. I know you've worked with Shirley Samuels, for example. How did it contribute to uh, white abolitionist and feminist discourses? Yeah, and so um, Shirley um, famously writes that um, sentiment can be said to be at the heart of American culture. And so I guess my work is sort of like this, the underside of that, which is if it is the heart of American, 19th century American culture, what does it mean to be heartless in response and therefore see the sort of underside of it? And so I feel like so much of what drew me to 19th century American literature and uh, um, as a field of study was because of its political drive um, and yet, at the same time, I was very resistant to the continual turns to sympathy and sentiment, which I think continues to resonate today in terms of how we talk about how minoritized people are supposed to make, um, make social change in part of how we validate the study of literature. That, again, it goes back to um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, that this, the validation ultimately is that sympathy allows you to, to feel right and to do, have the right type of politics. And of course, there are many critiques about um, sentiment and sympathy uh, in Americanist scholarship uh, going back to the 1970s with um, Ann Douglas's um, famous disagreements um, with uh, yeah, Ann Douglas and with um, Jane, Jane Tompkins. Mm -hmm. um, and but I sort of see as it sort of goes back and forth because of like that they say like this model of sympathy of sentiment is bad, but just do better. And I feel like that's the that's the continual model that we still see um, repeated over and over again. And so what I'm interested then is seeing like, what does it mean to refuse it, to step outside it, to be heartless again, um, to be unfeeling if we're um, almost overdetermined by, a bolt, uh, the, by the biopolitics of feeling. Um, and so there's a way that because it was so suffocating, I found myself as someone also suffocating in the discourse that I wanted to, a breath of a different type of era, I guess. Yeah, no, and I think um, your book is such an interesting critique of the field of ethic theory and the ways in which um, it, some versions of it are not sensitive to the centrality of affect and sentiment in racial orders and their reproduction. Um, how does your examination of disaffection translate to other spheres, law, politics, epistemology, aesthetics? Um, it's, I mean, I think you're, you're making an intervention in a companion way to work of uh, Mel Chen and Kyla Schuler and others um, who are really seeing um, effect, affect and disaffection or um, impressionability as part of a biopolitical form of power. But um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. What other yeah. spheres is it is disaffection a strategy in? 
Yes. And of course, in relation to your work, clearly. Um, and I think that and then I'm sort of just um, I'm interested in that phrase that come from well Charles Charles Taylor, but then what um, for instance the way that um, Glenn Coulthard takes it up to think about the colonial politics of recognition in Canada, and he reads it through Franz Fanon's work that like this the way that those politics of recognition always end up structuring um, minoritized groups' demands to the state that ends up um, just reconstituting that logic. And so I think that he's he's looks at different cultural examples, but then it's like also an example of the way that he's pushing back against like think the social policy and this other um, sort of legal workings that are happening in Canada as a settler nation that is trying to grapple with indigenous genocide, but then again sort of subsuming um, indigenous uh, demands, um, and yet he sort of asserts uh, the right to refusal and the right to anger. And so I think that this is that sort of resistance to the politics of recognition is something that applies uh, across so many other spheres of domination, as, as you suggest, in public discourse and so forth, that, again, it's like the appeal to affect, which is considered to be universalizing, um, that is supposed to like grease the wheels or be the catalyst of these different forms of change. Um, and that's something that I want to be very resistant to. And indeed, it's something that I think that um, one sees with what has been important with movements like Black Lives Matter, as well as Idle No More and uh, No Dapple, is this growing sense of, or the mainstreaming of a sense of refusal. And so for instance, in my opening, I particularly read um, the words of uh, it's one social media um, persona whose work I followed for a long time and I'm looking forward to reading his first book, um, Son of Baldwin, where back mm -hmm. in um, a number of years ago, as Black Lives Matter was kicking off, he has this one post talking about how he refuses to have sympathy with um, this one particular white woman who was, who was killed by a black police officer. And this sort of radical mode of being like, why should I care if white people have never cared about black and indigenous um, women who've been brutalized, for instance. And then he got so much pushback um, from, from readers, including what he said, um, those he called black and brown domestics. And I think that this is also just a tactic that I recognize in myself, as well as so many other minoritized people, particularly peoples, uh, black, indigenous, and other peoples of color, of being tired and being desensitized of the usual way of playing the sort of political game um, on the broader sphere as well as within our institutions of always having to be on the defensive and make those moves um, in order to prove words the appeals of universal feeling. And in my work, I sort of I could go and look at, say, Adam Smith, of course, and his idea of fellow feeling as a form of colonial, coloniality as what Denise Ferrer would would call like a strategy of engulfment. Um, and that's the sort of usual way that 19th century American literature, thinking about the work of Douglas and others tends to be read is, about the uh, the necessary proving that like black people are as human by um, and then basically freezing them into this sort of politics of recognition whereby they can have continually have to perform it over and over and that of course is something that Sadia Hartman critiques. Yes, and also a kind of um, coercive uh, forcible assimilation to certain notions of the subject. I think is one of the ways that you talk about it in your book. Um, and really, it creates a kind of ethical crisis uh, to to privilege um, or to to force racialized people to assimilate um, or to have these compulsory compulsory feelings of obligation, gratitude, uh, indebtedness, and so forth. Which, of course, you know, for me, reading your work, it resonates so much with coerced and unfree labor of mm. indentureship, bondage, servitude, debt peonage, and others. Um, but so I wanted to explore with you how disaffection could be more than mere unfeeling or the absence of feeling um, and how uh, maybe invite you to elaborate this notion of disaffection as feeling otherwise or feeling differently. Um, it suggested to me a, a kind of um, feeling beneath the radar, a kind of lateral feeling that refuses the imperatives of, of liberal sentimentalism um, that can't be read by the dominant gaze that is lateral between different racialized and excluded uh, groups and peoples. I, I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, um, and so on the one hand, I'm making space for like um, unfeeling and its negativity, but also I think that unfeeling again is a way of vilifying 
a type of um, forms of feeling that um, fall out of the dominant episteme or refuse to be responsive to them. Because of course, feeling is both responsive and demonstrative in, it, in its connotations. And this, this way that in, in order to be seen as sympathetic, um, minoritized people are supposed to be sympathetic to power. And so in my work, I'm interested in sort of picking that apart. And perhaps an illustrative example for me would be um, in Martin Delaney's um, only novel, Lake, there's a scene where um, his titular protagonist is on this like um, transatlantic trip of, of, for black emancipation, going to meet indigenous peoples as well. And he goes to the Choctaw nation. Mm -hmm. And when he's about to sit down with the Choctaw chiefs and infamously the Choctaw uh, were one of the, the five so-called civilized tribes for their adoption of chattel slavery. Like to talk to them, what does it mean to be indigenous and yet you're enslaving black people? And it's going to be a difficult conversation, but actually there's a white man who comes in and tries to disrupt the conversation and calls Blake the N-word. Um, but what they decide to do, even though the guy is, is married um, into um, the Choctaw um, that, um, nation, they decide to just send him out of the room in order to have that difficult conversation. It's not that difficult conversation doesn't happen. And I think this particularly speaks to like so much of the important work being done by Tiffany King and others about um, across black and indigenous studies. Um, but that white, whiteness has to be removed from the room. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I'd say that perhaps the quotidian experience many of us have had is being at, say, a public event or maybe a meeting and not being able to even re uh, show your response to mm -hmm. something that is really hurtful or really terrible. But then after when you leave it, then you, you move through the back channels of your WhatsApp group to messages and so forth. Because in that moment, it almost doesn't matter if you show register your shock, your distaste, distaste your anger, your sorrow, and so why waste that effort instead re, uh, rerouting that feeling elsewhere to alternate structures feeling to these other communities. And so again, yeah, I see it as both a 19th century thing, but also something that is very much coming out of lived experience now. But your, your last example is reminding me, uh, Lynn Festa has this wonderful, her study of 19th century French and British sentimentalism, um, discusses it as affective piracy, this way in which, um, uh, feeling is overdetermined, and there's a kind of not just suffocation and effacement, but also a, a theft um, through ventriloquization or um, you know various forms of marginalization. Um, so, what do we learn? You mentioned Sui Sanfar in your last chapter, and I just wonder what do you think we learn from the particular implication of Asians in the white economy of feeling considering 19th century anti-Chinese anxieties that you characterize as the twin oriental specters of the coolie and the sex worker. In what ways is white feeling directed towards Asians somewhat differently than it might be at other groups, for example, Blacks or Indigenous people? Um, and how are these affective uh, directions gendered? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, trying to think through the entangledness of comparative racialization um, is really important to me because I didn't want to do one of those projects where it was like, and this chapter will be the chapter that is about X identity and then this X identity. Right. Instead, I, I do want my work to sort of work holistically to think about, um, to be in conversation with each other. And so at the beginning of my book, I, I talk, um, I look at different gendered forms of what I call unsympathetic blackness that precisely because there's the way that well, the uh, whiteness has always been parasitic on black blackness, black affect, and particularly, well, I guess CNN calls it animatedness. There's almost this over demand for black expressiveness that actually puts them in a bind where an expression is not seen as, as not legible or is completely unacceptable. And so I look at that through um, works like Benito Serino, uh, Delaney's Blake, as well as uh, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, Ilo Leroy. Um, but then I end with Suisun Far, and I think that Oriental inscrutability is interesting counterpart to what I call unsympathetic blackness. Because on the one hand, Oriental inscrutability, of course, is the most nameable of perhaps any form of uh, racialized unfeeling. Um, but in that regard, I don't see it because it's the most poorly treated. There's something interesting about its coherence, which I think speaks to the way that it could be readily um, fetishized um, and perhaps made leg a legible in a begrudging way um, to, a, to, the, to a white gaze. And, and in the particular sense, case of Oriental credibility and Swiss and Far, I also sort of read it as this mi misunderstanding, this translation of the way that the Chinese concept of face sort of disrupts the, the, the false universality of, of sympathy and, and, um, and universal feeling. 
that it's like it's alternative uh, alternative taxonomy um, that doesn't uh, that they want to sort of push as being one of the mere derivations, I guess, to use Sylvia Linta's language as opposed to being a completely different sort of uh, affective and again social um, mo modes of expression and. So many, of course, like the, the missionaries that go, go to China or deal with um, Chinese migrants keep on like often like fixate on that particular on the idea of face as being like the key. And so like I think that, again, if it's fetishized and like have perhaps a degree of relative respect, whereas like I think black unsympathetic blackness, as I name it, like is so unthinkable that it's the thing which um, ends up being unnamed and perhaps the counterpart to what um, Sidia Cartman calls like the unthought of the position of the enslaved. Um, yeah, and I think that that is a really important nuance because on the one hand, I think it's important that we have a more complex relationship to oriental inscrutability than to simply decry it as a negative stereotype. And I'm thinking of like older hashtags like exp hashtag expressive Asians, um, that of course like that, that in itself is important. And yet when people are pushing back so defensively against it, it doesn't give any space for the fact that maybe sometimes you don't wanna react. Perhaps sometimes it makes sense to have this impassive, unreactive, uh, face because um, to use a phrase that I drew from Susan Farr's writing, um, she says like well her words like the Chinaman does not wear his heart on his sleeve, um, and because you have strategic reasons not to. Um, yeah, yeah. So I hope that speaks a little bit to your question. No, it does, and I I think it elaborates your notion of disaffection as as a political refusal. I just wonder. I'm going to ask one last question before we open it. I think Sangeeta is going to take some questions from um, people who are attending. But I wonder what lessons we can draw from your critique of feeling um, today in this moment of anti-Black and anti-Asian violence, and how can we stay with the negativity of unfeeling and suspend its rehabilitation or its overdetermination or co-option? Um, and how can we protest these compulsory norms of emotional expression and exchange? What kinds of counter intimacies would you recommend? Yeah, well, I think part of what I was seeing both over the summer with, um, with friends and also what I'm seeing with uh, friends now as well, is like this continual, the yeah, that expression of that expectation of ex, um, black expressiveness in the face of the spectacle of black suffering, and then also like Asian um, performances of effective humanity in order to get people to pay attention to um, our plight as well. And yet, what I was hearing first from um, from Black friends during the resurgence of BLM is, of course, that the exhaustion and the desensitization that they felt that now actually they felt like way, far more non-Black allies were reaching out to them in a very cursory way to check in to see if they're okay. Um, but that wasn't actually what they wanted and actually it was actually more exhausting because they were actually being asked to do more emotional labor, even though it was under the auspices of caring. And there's a sort of, and so it's this need to disengage and further nuance that this push beyond um, sympathy as as the go-to response for building some sort of coalition of solidarity. And likewise, I see this sort of burnout just happening over the last couple of weeks among so many people I know that of suddenly like media outlets are calling them up to opine on anti-Asian racism and violence um, when people didn't care before. And for initially people were responding because like we have a duty to step up, but now people are just getting really upset and pissed off because that's supposed to be like the extent to which performing our knowledge of those histories and to some extent our own traumas is also being expected uh, much in the way that there's just a broader, has been a broader cultural appetite for, for um, the black spectacle of, of, of sorrow and suffering in that way. So I guess it's this sort of a hesitancy that I, and the exhaustedness that I want to validate for people who don't want to participate and that this, the need to, have a type of reserve that perhaps, and again, in a racialized sense for Asian people would be seen as like oriental composure reserve or something like that. But that, that sort of reservation and that distancing is actually part, should be validated as part of self-care and self-healing as opposed to having to feel to be responsive. And even though sometimes in this moment with social media, it feels like um, immediacy has to be the, the response and the immediacy and effect, like our own affectability feeling terrible about things has to be the one way that we can actually participate in it but also that the, the withholding is just as important and so like the the space for that to affirm for people as individuals but then to also um think about how that sort of i don't care can act as a type of self-care but also 
finding others who feel um, feel otherwise in that way, we can then perhaps center other forms of feeling, other forms of sociality, uh, build other forms of structures of feeling. So, thank yes. you, Lisa, for those wonderful questions. Yes, well, um, I might just make a comment. I mean, I absolutely um, agree with you that, I mean, perhaps we could think about exhaustion as a form of disaffection um, as well. But just as your book sees both the negative and also the, um, the presence of other forms of feeling, I do think that there have been in heartening ways, um, Asian and Asian American responses that don't reproduce this discourse of sentimentalism um, that refuse uh, rescue or recognition in the ways that you're elaborating when, particularly when we make clear that anti-Asian and anti-Black violence are parts of the same structure of um, uh, a society structured in white dominance. And, um, and when we refuse Black criminalization or anti-Black policing as the prescribed mm -hmm. solution. Yes. I think that's a really productive way to short circuit this kind of compulsory normative feeling. Um, mm -hmm. I also think, you know, I've been to some really moving vigils um, in which there's a collective lamentation about what's occurring that is very different than the individualizing of anti-racism or the, um, the solution of criminalization as the remedy for what's occurring. Um, and I think there's, a, there's something really powerful there that's different than individual sentiment and also different than um, disaffection or unfeeling. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's an excess of feeling um, or a feeling directed otherwise. Anyway, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear what people have to say. Um, I just really um, you know, appreciate your work, of course, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. No, the pleasure is mine.